This is David Barsamian, and my guest is Andrew Nikoforik. He's an award-winning Canadian journalist. His articles appear in major newspapers and magazines. He's the author of Saboteurs, Empire of the Beetle. His book, Tar Sands, was honored with the Rachel Carson Environment Book Award. He's also the author of Energy of Slaves and Slick Water. Welcome to the program, and welcome to Colorado. Great pleasure, David. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Well, in November, there was a tectonic shift, as they say, if I can use a geological term, when uh, Justin Trudeau uh, became the new prime minister of Canada, ending 10 years of rule by Stephen Harper and the uh, Tories. Uh, Is this a new dawn in the country, something uh, that people should be excited about? What does Trudeau represent in terms of a real departure from Harper's uh, pro-business and pro-fracking and pro-tar sands policies? Well, it it is a substantive change. It it is not a revolutionary change, um, but it is a relief. Um, The Harper government was uh, really... uh, uh, a government of bullies that had little regard for law uh, as well as almost no regard for government. Um, The the Harper government was very much of the Koch brothers' school of thinking that the less government, the better, the less regulation, the better, the more free markets, the better for everyone. And with that whole parcel of things comes, of course, the, the push for lower taxes for the rich. And Harper really changed the Canadian government quite radically. I mean, that was a revolutionary government in the sense that uh, he had a very clear agenda to implement in a very serious way what the Koch brothers want the American government to, to implement. You know, no action on climate change, free ride for oil and gas companies, free ride for mining companies, virtually no or little environmental regulation no scientific capacity for government, no capacity for any kind of long-term planning, any kind of capacity for for helping those that are vulnerable or the poor. And he was quite successful in in putting that together. So Justin Trudeau was came along and said, you know, maybe we should we should really go back to the way Canada used to be governed, which was uh, which much more of a focus on on fairness and equality and and a more welcomeness to diversity. And so when he did come to power, the whole country literally did, uh, you know, issue a real sigh of of relief. But then again, I mean, Trudeau is not, uh, you know, we've removed the bully from the schoolyard, but we haven't changed the nature of the schoolyard. So Trudeau is still talking. Um, At least now we have a government that, that is prepared to admit that climate change exists and that we must do something about it. But the government is is keen on talk and and is yet really to act. Uh, we have but now a government that says yes, you know we we think that scientific evidence is important in policy decision making, so they are no longer uh, actively censoring scientists, but they are not repairing the damage that Harper did in the sense that, I mean, some of the country's very best scientists have have left the employer of the civil servants. They're not there. So that we, we don't have the same scientific capacity, whether it's marine research, climate change research, uh, water research. I mean, that's gone. It's, 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 it's been lost. And I, I don't see the government restoring that capacity. And, uh, you know, and then we have a government saying that, yes, you know, we, we're, we're encountering a, a huge fallout from the dramatic drop in oil prices because Canada is uh, the world's uh, sixth major oil exporter. Uh, we've got a currency that has been in free fall as a result. And uh, so we need to make some infrastructure uh, investments to kind of smooth things out. But Trudeau is still saying that, you know, growth and technology will save the day and, and bring Canada to a happier place. And he's also saying that, you know, still, we, you know, maybe we have to rehab some of these pipelines after all. And so there's this very kind of powerful illusion among Canada's political class that you you can somehow build pipelines exporting one of the world's dirtiest fuels, bitumen, and, and still actually do some kind of concrete action on climate change. All the evidence, both economic and scientific, says, no, you can't do that. That's ridiculous. Bitumen being tar sands. Bitumen is, is, is the is the heavy is the name for the heavy junk crude that you know most that industry prefers to call oil sands although you know you've, you've got to hand it to the Koch brothers i mean they 
They're the largest refiners of, of bitumen in the United States, and they simply call it a garbage crude. Good description. In the United States, we have political dynasties, Bush, Kennedy, Clinton. Canada, of course, that's where Pierre Trudeau, Justin's father, was prime minister in the 60s or 70s. Was there any uh, concern or commentary about this kind of uh, uh, political evolution? There definitely was uh, some uh, a lot of commentary about it and also uh, at a degree of concern. I mean, here we can see democracies, uh, you know, like Canada and also the United States and other, and other places in Europe, for example, I mean, are all struggling. I mean, I, I think you could make the argument that, that, that they have peaked in terms of citizen engagement and involvement and accountability. And, and as these uh, democracies are now all struggling um, with uh, global economic stagnation, and the fact that um, that capitalism is most likely peaked and that our energy sources are becoming more extreme and more difficult and therefore really um, dragging down uh, the economy in the sense that we really have to invest more money in, in these resources and, and accrue more debt and are getting less and less energy, quality energy in return. Um, and that's whether it's Arctic oil or whether it's oil sands or whether it's fracked oil from North Dakota. These are all extreme forms of energy, and uh, they're having a dramatic impact, I think, on the global economy. Uh, these governments really don't know how to respond to these events. Um, they only have one sort of vision, and that is, you know, one of uh, eternal growth, when in fact, you know, most of human history hasn't been about eternal growth. Most of human history has largely been about a very slow economic growth or economic stagnation for long periods of time. Um, but but in, in, so given this kind of economic volatility that we're experiencing, you, you can see people saying, you know, maybe dynasty isn't a bad idea. Maybe we need to go back to something that we're at least familiar with and, and know. And, and that's very much to the Trudeau story in Canada. Canada's population is about 35 million, yep. equivalent to California. Yet three quarters of the world's mining corporations are headquartered in Canada. What accounts for that, and how have they, how has uh, corporate mining structures been able to project themselves uh, all over the world? Papua New Guinea, Mexico, Peru, uh, parts of Africa. Well, this is really Canada's true character. We are a mining republic, and. Um, uh, this is something we do very well. I mean, we 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 know how to dig big, huge big holes in the ground and uh, extract resources and and leave formidable messes behind. Um, I mean, the legacy of mining, for example, in northern Canada uh, has been horrific. Where industry drilled and and dug more than ten thousand uh, metal mines of one kind or another, whether it was copper or gold or lead. And uh, or nickel and and left behind uh, and and abandoned uh, uh, as many as ten thousand mines, all of them with with you know terrible issues of of, of tailings ponds and and leaching plon ponds and toxic messes of one kind of of another, and and yet I mean this is what Canadians do. I mean we we are very much wedded and addicted to the extraction of one resource after another. You know, and, and we started out with, with fish and trees, and now we've graduated to uranium and bitumen um, and gold. And, and then we've just taken that mindset and, and colonized other places of the globe, and, and quite often brutally. I mean, we, we've had, you know, really brutal mining operations in Guatemala, in Peru, in Greece, in Africa, where we uh, these companies have quite often flaunted the law, uh, left huge messes behind them, and have taken the money and run. And, and this is very much part of the Canadian character. I mean, everyone looks upon Canada as you know this kind of gentle giant from the north, you know, where where there is some talk about equality and fairness, and you know, and and where the environment is at least you know discussed. Yet our true character really is that of an engineer, and and an engineer is very skilled at at, at mining. And it, it's quite fascinating to me as a Canadian, but, but who was raised in the United States, you know, one of the, that, that the Canadians don't want to discuss the nature of our real character as a people. And one of the reasons we never had a true national debate 
about the race and pace of development of the oil sands really comes down to this fact. We didn't want to have a debate about our character as a people and our kind of Jekyll Hyde mentality, you know, that during the boom period, we're vicious bullies, mining bullies, and during the bust period, you know, uh, out, out comes the, you know, the mild Dr. Jekyll. And has the uh, new uh, Trudeau regime in Ottawa indicated that there'll be any uh, shift in these, um, in that mind mindset? Well, again, there's been some talk, um, but it is only talk. And a great many of of the important backers of the Liberal Party in Canada are, of course, all involved in some aspect of mining, um, whether we're, we're talking about mining in the oil sands or um, heavy metal mining in British Columbia or other parts of the world. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that the Trudeau government is going to really embrace the kind of transparency and necessary reforms that um, would force this industry to to retreat, which it, it now really truly needs to do. How was um, Obama's decision to not go forward with the Keystone XL, XL uh, project pipeline, how was that received uh, in Canada? Well, uh, under the Harper regime, I, m- I mean, the government was, was very outraged. They pretended as though this was, you know, the, the worst thing um, our dear American friends could, could do to us. Um, uh, and um, uh, But for Trudeau, it, it is, you know, Trudeau has treated it, um, uh, saying, look, you know, the, this, this was an American decision. Um, the American president was in total rights to make the decision he did. And... Um, and uh, you know, and we will continue discussing this issue down the road. But the reality again is simply this: that Canada Canada cannot build any more bitumen pipelines, or uh, or, or or pipelines for oil sands export, whether it's Keystone Exoil or whether it's Kinder Morgan in British Columbia, um, or or whether it's Northern Gateway in British Columbia, or whether it's the Energy East Line. We cannot do that and meet our Paris talk agreements or, or uh, meet and any other agreements to, to lower greenhouse gases in, in the country because bitumen extraction at this point in time accounts for such, such an extraordinary amount of greenhouse gas emission growth that the only way for Canada to reduce emissions in any coherent, logical, and rational fashion is really to limit um, expansion of, of, of the oil sands. And, and yet there's no politician in Canada that, that, that is talking that way. Uh, Trudeau is saying, you know, yeah, we can talk about windmills and pipelines. Um, they're, you know, they're at, at the same time. They're, you, can, you know, we, we, we can have one and we can have but the other. So, another, so again, this, this fantasy idea that we can live in both worlds. Um, the uh, premier of Alberta, you know, which is our, you know, the, the equivalent of Texas in Canada, uh, Rachel Notley, uh, a new premier, she replaced a, a Tory government that was there for 43 years that was all about pipelines and expanding bitumen production and oil sands production um, at, 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 you know, incredible rates. I mean, we had rates of Chinese-like development in the province to support the extraction of this resource with no attention to volatility in prices, with no attention to, to the climate change impacts, with no attention to the impacts on First Nations, no, no, no attention really to the impacts on water, which are huge. So it was almost this kind of hedonistic, libertarian approach to, oh, come, come, you know, here we've got a resource, we've lowered the royalties, there's no taxes, come and get it, boys. And, and you know, the global boys did from all over the world, whether it was, you know, the Norwegians, the Koch brothers from the United States, um, Imperial Oil. Uh, British Corporation? It, 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 oh, no, Imperial Oil is actually a, a big part of ExxonMobil. That's what we oh. call it in, in, in Canada. So, you know, ExxonMobil, the world's second largest or first major, major, uh, one of the, the world's largest corporations, is they're all involved in tar sands production. So, you know, we expanded like mad, promoted pipelines like mad, forgetting that, you know, bitumen is a junk crude. 
It's got lots of liabilities. It's 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 got a 17% uh, larger greenhouse gas footprint than conventional oil. Uh, it requires more energy to mine and extract. Its energy returns are actually appalling uh, for the steam plants where we're steaming deep bitumen deposits in, in the ground and melting it and bringing it to surface. I mean, they, the energy returns are one on one. Well, you, you know, you need energy returns of at least one on 10 if you want to uh, survive as a, as, as a civilization these days. So we, we didn't pay any attention to those liabilities, overinvested, overexpanded, and contributed really to a global oversupply of oil. And we were paying no attention to what the Saudis might think about this. We also weren't paying attention to all the frackers in North Dakota, you know, fracking North Dakota like mad and parts of Texas like mad, and dramatically increasing the production of light oil in the United States. And so, you know, the, the Saudis look at all this and say, wow, you know, we, we've got a fair market share here for our conventional oil. We don't want to lose it. We know that climate change is going to be a big issue. And, you know, we've got cheap oil. We're going to sell it as much of it as we can before the world really gets serious about climate change. So they made no effort to, to make any adjustment in production while the Canadians and Americans are pouring more oil on the global market. And they said, screw you guys. And the price drops. And uh, uh, Canadian industry is in a free fall, um, as are the frackers in the United States. And the Saudis are quite happy. They're still making uh, uh, a decent dollar because it only costs about 10 bucks to extract their stuff, where, you know, the cost of extraction in North Dakota is 60 bucks. The cost of extraction for oil sands is 80 bucks. So almost everyone in the oil sands to, right now are, are losing money. So for a premier and a prime minister to come along and then say the solution to global overproduction and low prices is to bring more uh, uh, of a cheap product <laughs> to, to tidewater ports is economic craziness of the highest order. And, but it's another illustration of, of the power of the oil and gas industry and of the poverty of political leadership that we see on a global scale. Clarify what you mean by one to one and one to ten. Okay, so it, it takes uh, for for energy return and energy investments. You typically talk about one unit of energy being used to create uh, four or five units more or ten units more. So a uh, hundred years ago, it would take, for example, one barrel of oil or oil equivalent to discover and find and extract and uh, put on the market one hundred more barrels of oil. Huge, amazing energy return, uh, which I would argue is really the basis for, for modern capitalism, that, that, you know, that cheap energy. This has now all changed. I mean, the cheap energy is gone. Um, uh, business as usual is really over. The energy returns have dropped dramatically. So on a global basis, where we, it takes about one barrel of oil or oil equivalent to produce um, uh, 20 more. In the United States, it takes about one barrel of oil to produce around 15 more. In the tar sands, in the mining operations, it takes one barrel oil or oil equivalent to put five in the marketplace. And for the steam plants, where, where it, you put one in it, unit in and you're getting one unit back, that that is a catastrophic development. And you know, I'm, and, and uh, to, to to explain this further, uh, uh, I mean, some of the drawbacks of renewables are that they really don't have the same capacity to create energy on the same scale as fossil fuels. So you, you can take one, one unit of energy to, um, uh, will, will, will create returns, let's say, for, for, for solar um, of around 10 to, to 15. Um, uh, wind is perhaps a little bit higher, but it's intermittent. Um, uh, the renewable with with the highest energy returns is, is hydropower, where one unit might give you you know something along the order of fifty or sixty in returns. But there's a very you know dramatic limit to how far you can go with with hydropower. You no doubt heard about the revelations that Exxon scientists um, knew about climate change, global warming, as early as the nineteen seventies, and then that was uh, covered up. Uh, there's some talk in the U.S. about uh, possible legal action against this super uh, national corporation that's so powerful, Exxon uh, Mobil. Uh, was that, what was the response in Canada to those revelations? 
Uh, very limited response in Canada. Again, I mean, very little political discussion among the 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 political class of the country um, about uh, and you know, a very powerful industry that has been funding climate change denial for more than thirty years. Um, not surprising, given the fact that I mean, the only conversation we still hear from from Canadian politicians is that yes, we can somehow address climate change and still. Uh, export more bitumen. Um, so, you know, we're still having a crazy dialogue uh, about this. But what's interesting about the, the revelations about ExxonMobil is is that you, we begin to see a consistent pattern, um, uh, particularly in, in big oil, on a number of other issues. So, I mean, what we're finding now with climate change was that the scientists who were working for these companies knew about these liabilities and how strongly they would grow over time. It's exactly the same thing uh, that scientists knew with hydraulic fracturing. So uh, nearly 30, 40 years ago in Oklahoma, the government of the United States was experimenting with large, massive hydraulic fracturing uh, operations where they were taking uh, millions of gallons of water and injecting them into the ground. And this would be around late 1970s, 1978. And these were these were experiments being done by the U.S. Geological Survey and and others, and by the Department of Energy. And and what they found very, was you know very dramatically was that if you're using that much force and propelling fluids into the ground uh, under that amount of pressure, a mile or two below the surface, you will trigger earthquakes. And so the science was very dramatically saying that, all right, if you take this technology, which is uncontrollable, and you start applying it across North America uh, in shell formations that uh, where you don't know where the faults are and where the fractures are, you will trigger earthquakes. The industry was in a state of denial about this very issue for the last decade. They said, well, yes, you know, these will be anomalies with, and, and they'll be very, very small earthquakes. Nobody will feel them. No one will notice them. Uh, there's no problem here, really. And that was complete and total. Um, you know, it, it wasn't the truth. And now we have earthquakes in northern BC being triggered by hydraulic fracturing, for, uh, fracturing operations by uh, companies, by uh, Malaysian companies, Spanish companies, other multinationals. On an order of magnitude 4.6, 4.8, you hit a magnitude 5 earthquake, and you have substantial public infrastructure damage. And in Oklahoma, where you have massive injection wells, where you're taking large amounts of fluid uh, over long periods of time, injecting them into the ground, uh, again, a mile or two below the surface, um, I, I mean, you've changed the seismic act, uh, seismic patterns of the whole state. It's now the most seismically active part of the United States, more seismically active than California. And you have caused earthquakes as high as 5.4, 5.6, um, with uh, extreme property damage. Uh, I mean, this is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. But the industry was in a state of denial about all of this. It's also been in a state of denial about another really critically important part of hydraulic fracturing, and that's the whole phenomenon of, of gas migration. And, and what we're talking about here are leaky well bores. Um, you know, there's been more than 4 million well bores drilled in North America. All of them are leaking to one extent or another. Into the aquifer? Uh, no, they're leaking into the atmosphere or into aquifers. Um, and, and the issue here is is you, you seal a well bore with a, a, a casing, and the casing is made of cement. And, of course, uh, the cement will degrade over time. So it's a bit like the story of a piece of bubble gum uh, that somebody leaves under a school desk, that over time it will crack and corrode and, you know, become crumbly. And, that, and that's what, what's happening to these well bores. So you have this existing problem with, with gas migration, either in so that the gas is, is, is leaking from these well bores and it's leaking into the atmosphere, leaking into groundwater, uh, sometimes coming up in, in, in other places. So you have that problem. And then you add hydraulic fracturing, which is an earthquake making activity. <laughs> and uh, so you're rattling all of this existing infrastructure with the result that you are increasing the rate of gas migration. So you are releasing more and more methane and CO2 and radon into the atmosphere. Become, you, you've got massive problems with these methane anomalies now in the San Juan Basin, massive problems with CO2 anomalies now in, the, the, in Oklahoma. Um, 
and uh, and again, the industry was in a state of denial about these very well-known uh, scientific facts 30 or 40 years ago. Now, you lived and worked in Alberta for many years, and now you're based in uh, British Columbia on Vancouver Island. Uh, talk about the differences in the politics between the two provinces and also uh, attitudes toward fracking. Is there major fracking operations going on in, in British Columbia on Vancouver Island? Yeah. The, 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 the government of British Columbia is really not all that much different than the government of, of, of Alberta. Uh, I mean, most Canadian provinces uh, are, uh, and Canadian politicians have only one vision, economic vision, and that is the extraction of one resource or another for export to Asia. So <clears throat> I've actually moved to a province, uh, <coughs> excuse me, David, that is uh, uh, totally obsessed with exporting uh, shale gas from northern British Columbia um, to Asia via um, uh, liquefied natural gas terminals. So we, we want to pull all of this gas out of the ground. We want to build at least five liquefied natural gas terminals. There's proposals for 20 along our coast, and, um, and we want to ship this gas to, 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 to China. And we're saying, what, the Chinese are going to use this to replace their coal-fired plants there's no guarantee the Chinese will use the, that gas for, for, for that at all. I mean, it'll, it'll all depend on the economics. They, they actually have access to much cheaper gas from Russia via pipelines. But, um, but this whole dream has imploded, again, with the collapse in oil prices. So you've seen a dramatic class, uh, collapse in, in natural gas prices. Um, and so nobody's investing or, or going anywhere at the moment. But the, the government is hanging fast on to this, this dream. And they've lowered taxes, and they've provided companies with free water and free geoscience, um, all with the goal of somehow propping up something that, that even the, the, the marketplace is saying, uh, this would be a stupid idea to invest in this right now. So that's the problems I've, I've, I've moved to. Um, there is a hell of a lot of fracking going on in northern British Columbia. Um, a lot of it is a very deep, high-volume fracking. Uh, and with and as a result, we have a, a major uh, earthquakes having been been triggered by by industry, we have no idea how this is changing groundwater flow. We have virtually no idea how this is changing um, gas migration into the atmosphere or into water sources, because the government has re so far to date really refused to do the monitoring. There is no gas migration monitoring, and there are only six wells that test groundwater, and none of them are long-term observation wells. We just got one minute. If you could talk about the pushback and resistance from groups on the ground to these various mining and fracking and tar sands operations. Well, the pushback was was I mean the 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 governments and industry um, have resorted to propaganda on a ma massive scale to somehow convince Canadians that. The overinvestment in in the oil sands and the overinvestment in shale gas in northern BC um, has been a good thing. When in fact it, it, it's it's uh, economic foolhardiness. Um, it's an example, really, of of uh, uh, this kind of hedonistic libertarian thinking that somehow the free market uh, knows everything and will do everything well. When in fact these resources actually belong either to the people of Alberta or to the people of, of British Columbia, and nobody properly consulted with those people to say, "Do you want to participate in this massive rape of a resource over a short period of time?" Um, nobody asked that question, and and that's the question that still needs to be asked. In terms of resistance, the groups well, okay. on the ground. Yeah. Okay. Well, in terms of resistance. Um, their uh, First Nations are asking more and more questions about pipelines and about fracking. Um, uh, the Canada is still largely a rural, uh, largely an urban-based people, and so from the cities we see very few uh, or very little resistance to these massive extractive exercises that are taking place in rural areas. On the other hand, we do see a, a great deal of resistance in rural areas, particularly again from farming communities to this scale and intent of, of these fracking operations. But very, very little media coverage 
of these grassroots organizations. I've been talking with Andrew Nikiforek. He's an award-winning Canadian journalist, author of uh, many books, including Energy of Slaves and Slick Water. Thanks very much for your time, Andrew. Thank you, David. I'm David Barsamian. Thank you for listening.